Hey guys, welcome back to another IGCSC chemistry video and today we're going to be having a look at the unit 2 of the experimental technique. So in today's video, we're going to be having a look at the part 2. So in the last video, we had a look at unit 1 where we had a look at the particular nature of matter. And in today's video, we're going to be having a look at experimental techniques. Okay. So before we start with the video, let me tell you the outline. So what we're basically going to be discussing in today's video. So first of all, you need to know that I am going to be categorizing this video with core and supplement. So core basically means that if you're doing the core paper, you only need to know some certain topics in this entire chapter. But if you're doing supplement, meaning you need to know everything that I discuss in today's video. Okay, so this is just a quick look at what we're going to be discussing. And mainly we're going to be focusing on chromatography because it's a very uh, you know, popular question that is tested in examinations. So a further ado, let's begin and let's introduce you to what is chromatography. So from the name chromatography basically means chroma is color and graph is picture. So the name chromatography is color picture. Okay, so chromatography is basically a technique that is used to separate and identify components of a mixture. From the name it says color picture, but again in this definition there is nothing or it's not mentioned in anything with relation to color now this is because chromatography can also be used to separate or can separate colorless mixtures too and therefore in the definition we don't specify color okay but mainly chromatography is used to separate ink and dye in the chemistry syllabus but again you need to know that chromatography does not only separate colored substances but also can separate um, colorless mixtures Okay, so that's the definition of chromatography and an example would be the mixture of dyes and inks. Now you need to know that it is very, very popular and they usually test you on dyes and inks. Okay, sometimes there's amino acids, but mainly they test you on dyes and inks. Basically, they give you a picture, they can tell you, you know, find the RF value, they can tell you, you know, identify the substance, they can give you those types of questions. But again, if you don't understand them right now, don't worry, by the end of the video, you will understand everything with RF values, how to identify substances, how far the substance is moved, uh, the apparatus needed, and everything stuff like that. So just wait and be patient and you will understand everything. Now, that's just a quick brief introduction of chromatography. Now, let's have a look at the procedure on how you can perform chromatography. So we start with step one. Step one will basically uh, involve the setting up of the chromatographic chamber. What is the chromatographic chamber? Basically, this is the setup that you need for the chromatography. So the apparatus that you need is a beaker or a gas jar and you have to fill this with a suitable solvent okay and i will show you this in a form of diagram so if you don't understand this through theory i will show you in a diagram and explain further so just bear with me for a few minutes till i explain this in theory now after you set up the beaker with the solvent you need to cover the beaker with a petri dish now why do we cover the beaker with the petri dish this is basically used to allow the chamber to get saturated with the solvent that you've put in the beaker. Okay, so they can ask you that, why do we cover it with the petri dish? You basically say that we, allow, we can allow, you know, the chamber to get saturated, okay, so that the paper doesn't, you know, go out of the beaker. We move on to step two. So step two involves the preparing of the chromatography paper, a very important stage. Now, the chromatography paper can be, you know, uh, hang on some stick or something and you have to dip it in the solvent but before doing that we have to draw a horizontal line in the chromatography paper now later on i will tell you why you need the horizontal line because you need this in step four the horizontal line is drawn in a pencil okay here is a keyword the pencil why not a pen okay they can ask you a question why do we use a pencil and not a pen now, we do not use a pen because, remember, chromatography is used to separate inks and dyes. And if we use a pen, that is a form of ink. So it will interfere with, you know, our results because it will smudge as soon as it enters the solvent because it's an ink. But a pencil doesn't have ink or any dye and therefore, you know, we'll have a fair test. Okay, now we call this horizontal line on the chromatography paper a baseline or some people call it the line of origin. We move on to step three and step three is basically on how we can identify this dye. Now from the baseline when you dip it okay 
the sample will move upwards, meaning it will spread upwards, okay, from the baseline, okay, and this is done two to three times, so having a fair test, okay, so basically the mixture or that has the dye will basically separate by going up, it'll travel up the chromatography paper as soon as you dip it in the solvent, okay, and you'll understand again in the diagram, so if you don't understand right now, don't worry okay and finally step four step four basically involves running the chromatograph okay this basically means that once when i get the chromatography paper prepared i have the solvent prepared i have to simply dip the chromatography paper okay till it is the solvent level is below the baseline okay so the solvent has to be below the baseline and then you can see the solvent will move up the paper and the separation will begin now, once when the separation has reached about three fourths of the paper, the chromatogram is removed off from the chamber and the air is dry. Now, here are the diagrams. So you can see right here, um, you can see the solvent is below the line. Okay, let me rub this and you'll see that. Okay, the pencil mark right here, very light. Okay, you can see a very light horizontal line. The solvent is below that. Okay, and here the, the mark right there is the dye that we have to separate and you can see it's traveling upwards and until it reaches three fourth is you have to wait and then after that you remove the paper and let it dry okay once you've understood that let's have a look at this diagram now and let's have a look at you know identifying the part of the apparatus of it so you can see right here is the uh, you know the beaker okay in the beaker we've used a rod and we have hanged the chromatography paper here is the solvent line and it's below the baseline, okay? The baseline is made in pencil and you can see they, they're emphasizing on the pencil a lot because it's very important because if you use a pen, it will interfere with the results, okay? Here is the mixture of the colored dyes. Now you can have many colored dyes and then you would see which one has traveled the furthest, okay? And uh, that's how you can, you know, identify their dye, okay? And now later on, I will tell you how you can identify it. This is just the basics. Now you can see they're using some clips to hold on to the paper and have it a steady position because if you keep moving it again it will interfere with the results so here we have a more you know uh, detailed explanation with the diagram okay so here is the separation of a black ink okay we have the chromatography paper okay we have the spot on the baseline okay it has to be on the baseline once when i dip it into the beaker the solvent soaks up the paper and travels up Okay, and you can see, it's always emphasizing that the baseline is above the solvent. Okay, so now the black ink is going up. Now we have three types of areas. We have dye P, dye Q, and dye R. So there are three spots, and therefore there are three dyes in the black ink. Okay, and that's how you identify, um, you know, the dyes that consist in the black ink or in a certain type of mixture. Okay, so... You will see again, let me go back to this. You can see that there's one color right here, there's another color right here, and there's another color right there. That is three colors, and therefore there are three inks. Okay, that's how you identify, you know, um, something in, um, in black ink, for example. Now, here's a question. Why does separation occur? Now, separation occurs because the substances have different solubilities in the solvent and are absorbed. Uh, are absorbed sorry to different degrees by the chromatography paper okay so separation basically occurs and is always involved with the solubility of different you know substances and as a result they are separated gradually as the solvent moves up the paper because of the different solubility levels so that's why chromatography works so they can ask you why does chromatography work like that okay that when i dip something why is it going up it basically is going up because of the solubility levels, okay? And that's why chromatography works. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Interpreting the simple chromatograms. Okay, so now here's, you know, more detail on how can I identify it further. One spot after the separation. When there's only one spot after the separation, the substance spotted is a single substance, meaning it's pure, okay? That means it's not a mixture, but instead it is only pure. So if you only see one spot after the separation, it is a pure substance. Okay, so right here we can say, um, sorry for the really bad handwriting, but we can say right here it is pure. 
okay? It is pure. The second one says that more than one spot of the separation, the substance spotted is a mixture and it is impure because there's more than one spot, meaning there are two substances involved in this mixture. Number three says a number of spots basically means there is a number of components in the mixture. And the last one says if the spot does not move from the baseline, the sample is insoluble. Okay, it's insoluble and therefore chromatography cannot work with this mixture. Okay, and here we have another diagram and you can see we have A, B, C and D. Okay, A you can see there's only one. Okay, when there's only one dot, okay, on A, that means that it's a pure substance. But in B, as you can see, it is two. Okay, and when, you, when there's more than one spot, it is an impure substance, meaning there's, there's two substances in the mixture. With C, as you can see, it's not moving, okay? When it's not moving, it basically means that it's insoluble. And you can see right here, when the B and D, same spot, okay, basically means the same substance that is involved in B and D, okay? So that's how you identify them. And uh, we have the solvent front. Solvent front is basically from the baseline to the solvent front, we say one, okay? Later on, you'll understand why we have the solvent front because of the RF value. So when you want to calculate the RF values, you basically want to know the solvent front of the baseline, okay? So now let's have some questions, okay? It says here, the diagram shows the chromatogram obtained from the four dyes, A, B, C, and D. It says give one concept, one conclusion that can be drawn about dye B. As I told you before, dye B right here has two dots. And, and I remember when it has two dots, it is impure because it has two substances in the mixture. So you can see right here, it's saying dye B is a mixture of two dyes. There you go, two dyes, two substances. And one of the two dyes is dye D because remember it's on the same level. Because it's on the same level, it means it's the same dye. Okay, the next one is say, suggest why dye C remained on the baseline. Okay, why did dye C remain on the baseline? Dye C remained on the baseline because it is insoluble. So you can see it's a quite simple uh, understanding. So when there's only one dot, that means it is pure substance. When there's two dots, it's an impure substance, meaning there's two dyes. When it remains in the baseline, it is insoluble. And when it's on the same level, it basically means it's the same dye. Okay, so that's quite easy. Let's move on. And now let's have a look at the RF values. Now, RF values are usually always tested in multiple choice questions. And it is one of the easiest questions that you can encounter. But before having a look at that, let me describe what solvent front is and what solute front is. Solid front is basically the distance traveled by a solute, which is the spot on the chromatogram. And this is measured from the baseline to the center of the spot using the ruler. But the solvent front is the distance from traveled by the solvent on the chromatogram, and this is measured from the baseline. The RF value is simply the solute front divided by the solvent front. And the RF values are used to identify the solutes by the comparison between the RF values. So the RF values are simply the distance that is traveled by that spot that you have been testing. Okay, how far has it gone in the chromatography paper? Simple and very easy. Now, usually in the exams, they give you a diagram, and you have to simply identify, you know, what is the RF value. So they'll say, what is the RF value of, you know, dye C? And you have to simply measure it uh, in terms of, you know, a fraction, like it's threefold or it's 0 0.6, okay? And uh, you, you will just see right now in a minute, okay, with the question, okay? So here we have a question and it says the RF values are used to identify compounds. Calculate the RF value of dye A. So we say it is telling us that the solvent front to the baseline is 5 centimeters. If it is 5 centimeters, A is 3 out of 5. Remember that, 3 out of 5. Okay, it has traveled 3 centimeters out of the 5 centimeters. And therefore, its R value is 3 out of 5, which is 0 0.6, as simple as that. Sometimes they don't even give you these 5 centimeters and you have to assume it's probably 1, okay? And then you would say, okay, this is what 0 0.5. So therefore, if it's uh, 0 0.5 here, this should be 0 0.6. Okay, so it's 0 0.6. So it's as simple as that. So now let's have a look at the locating agents. Now, chromatography techniques can be applied to colorless substances by exposing chromatograms to substances called locating agents. Now, for substances that are colorless, we use something called locating agents. Okay, now locating agents are basically chemical reagents that react with separated 
spots to form a colored product. Basically, it reacts with the colorless spots and will therefore form the colored product. Okay, so for stuff that is colorless, we use the locating agents. And these spots can be visible upon the exposure of the locating agent. And then, of course, we can use the RF values because now they can be seen. Okay, now spots can be visible using the UV light. Okay, so UV light is a locating agent. Okay, so iodine is also a locating agent. Okay, now you need to know that the knowledge for the specific locating agents is not required. So that means that you do not need to know that UV light is one of the locating agents. So here we have a question. A student carried out a paper chromatography on a mixture of amino acids. Okay, the student sprayed the dried chromatogram with the locating agent. What is the function of the locating agent? So first of all, you need to identify that amino acids are colorless. The locating agent will react with the colorless spot and will form or make them visible by making it colored. And therefore, we can calculate the RF value. That would be the best answer for that question. Now let's have a look at a pure substance with having a unique melting point and boiling point. For example, the melting point of pure water is 0 degrees and the boiling point is 100 degrees. Now, the presence of impurities basically means it might be lower than the melting point and it might also have a higher boiling point. Okay, so how can we identify the purity of a substance? So first of all, we can have a look at the purity of the substance with chromatography. But another way is to determine by just, you know, using the melting point and the boiling point. So, for example, if I melt something, if I melt water and it's not... You know zero degrees then I know that it has the presence of impurities or if I boil water and it exceeds 100 degrees then I know again there is a presence of impurities okay so purity of substances is the utmost importance of everyday life from you know medicines foodstuffs so it's very important to know if a substance is pure so that will mark the end of the video hopefully you enjoyed this video hopefully you understood everything that i talked about again if you don't understand anything the comment section is available and i will try to respond to your answers thank you for watching this video and i'll see you in part three uh, where we'll have a look at the next topic see you.